Dear St. Andrews members and friends, this week's essential tool for living in a time of pandemic is compassion. A scripture passage this week is from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 34, and then we'll skip to verse 53 to 56. This passage narrates the return of Jesus' disciples after Jesus has sent them out two by two to cast out evil and proclaim the good news that God has drawn near to God's people. They come back, relishing the way that God has moved through them, but also exhausted. Jesus suggests a quiet retreat for the disciples who need a little rest and relaxation. r and as it's called in the military. But that isn't what happens. Listen for God's word to us today. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Jesus said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they didn't even have leisure to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. The passage goes on to recount the miraculous feeding of this huge crowd of 5,000. And then the story of Jesus coming to the disciples, walking on the sea. I'll pick up again at verse 53. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever Jesus went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. For the word of God here in scripture, for the word of God among us and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Well, Jesus and his exhausted disciples had taken a boat to a deserted place. But the people had seen them go and a crowd followed them and found them. Their planned retreat was interrupted. Bummer, who could blame the tired disciples if they uttered a discouraged sigh or even a curse as they saw the crowd of people on the shoreline. But Mark tells us that as Jesus was going ashore, he saw the great crowd and he had compassion for them. Jesus saw a crowd, a great mass of people who were not yet part of his beloved community, but who potentially could be. Jesus saw these people who were trying to, as best they could, to make their way through that maze we call life, and he felt compassion, not judgment, not disdain, not fear, not a sense of alienation or superiority, but compassion. Our text says Jesus felt compassion. And why? Because when he looked at them, he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. He saw people who were living in difficult times, economic, political, cultural, and their leaders, both the politicians and the religious leaders, were failing in their task of guiding and supporting them toward a meaningful and whole life. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? For the most part, they were either being ignored or used, not helped by their leaders, by those who were supposed to be good and caring shepherds. If we look around our world today with the eyes of Jesus, what we see is not that different. We see people struggling, 
just to survive. We see people dealing with sickness, fear, loneliness, and constant stress. People struggling to find acceptance. People who are afraid for their lives. People who are wrestling with questions of injustice and suffering. People who are harassed and fragmented and pulled in many directions. People who don't know who they can trust, who they can believe. People who need mercy and need justice. People struggling to find meaning in life. Everywhere. If we see with the eyes of Jesus, we see people who need some good news, people who need some relief from their stresses and burdens, people who need more freedom, people who need healing of their body or their mind or their soul or their spirit, people looking for some peace, people hungering for some understanding acceptance, and compassion. When Jesus saw the great crowd, he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion, says Frederick Beekner, is the sometimes fatal capacity for feeling what it is like to be inside of somebody else's skin it is imaginatively walking a mile in the moccasins of another, as the wise Native American saying puts it. Compassion leads us out of our isolated lives to sympathize with and then to reach out with a helping hand to the other person. We see a human being, a person not so different from us, who is suffering, and we feel compassion that feeling of deep sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. Nothing is more natural than compassion, or is it? For children, it may be. Young children will spontaneously start crying when they see another person suffering or in pain and want to do something to help. But soon we learn to shut our eyes. Our own struggles and suffering make it hard to open our own hearts to others. Still we try, but often we become tragically dry. And we experience compassion fatigue. I know what this feels like. You know what this feels like. So sometimes we do need to withdraw from the fight and take care of our own needs. Exercise a little self-compassion. The Gospels record in today's text that even Jesus and his disciples had to do this. Taking time to deal with our own issues and our own inner wounds, fears and doubts with compassion, acceptance and love is fundamental to living the compassionate life but we can't turn inward forever. For example, sleep is good and necessary to replenish mind, body, and soul, but we can't sleep all day and all night. We need to open our eyes and really see, see both the good and the bad in our world, see both the joys and the blessings, see and take them in, and also allow ourselves to see and feel the sorrows and the challenges and the injustices that need writing and changing. David Carlson writes that we live in a time in which it is possible to run away from sorrow. Our culture encourages us to avoid pain, to take a pill, have a drink, seek a distraction. Certainly many of us are doing this during the time of pandemic and we need to have some compassion on that. We're also tempted to build emotional walls to insulate us from the suffering of the world. We can easily become numb to the sorrows, the injustices, the pains of our fellow human beings. We're over 150,000 dead from COVID-19. That 
It's hard to take that in, such a big number, but each one a person. If we allow ourselves to shut down and not feel that suffering, well, the danger with that is we also, suffer, we also cut ourselves off from the sources of life and joy because God is with suffering people. If we want to near, be near to God, we need to be where God is. That's why Jesus invites us to take up his cross and come along with him. The path to joy and the path to God is this path of compassion. We must challenge the temptation of comfort. We need the courage to expose ourselves to others' pain and to learn from the pain in our own lives. So writes David Carlson. Now this isn't easy. Milan Kundara, the Czech novelist and playwright, speaks the truth when he says that there is nothing heavier than compassion. Not even one's own pain weighs so heavily as the pain one feels for someone. Pain intensified by the imagination and prolonged by a hundred echoes. This is why we often desperately try to fix other people to relieve our own discomfort at their suffering. And if we can't fix them, here's where the problem comes in. If we can't fix them, then we withdraw to protect ourselves. But the truth is that if we aren't in touch with the pain in our own lives, we will have little sympathy for the pain of others. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor and love yourself. Love yourself and love your neighbor. You can't have one without the other. The truth is that if we can't face the pain of life in ourselves and in others, if we close our eyes to the reality of suffering, we diminish our own souls. Thomas Merton, in his spiritual classic, The Seven Story Mountain, bluntly tells this hard, counterintuitive truth. He says that the more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer. Because smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear of being hurt. This is tragic, and it happens all the time. I've seen it happen to people I love. Don't let it happen to you. Or if it has, recognize that it has happened to you. And then pray and courageously open your heart. If something is going to wound your soul, let it be something big, something grand, some great wrong, not some trifle. Let yourself feel compassion for your own suffering and for the suffering of others. Can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? Can I see another's grief and not seek for kind relief? So asked the poet William Blake. Clearly we can, but only at the cost of our own soul, our own humanity. Without compassion, we shrink and become small, smaller, brittle, dried up. This is something that happens inside our hearts. To the outside world, we may even look stronger, tougher, more realistic. But this is just a front. We need to see with the eyes of Jesus, which are the eyes of compassion and then act, as he did, to heal as best we can. Action without seeing is a dangerous thing. Without seeing, we can become complacent and compassionless. Shirley Chisholm says that most Americans have never seen the ignorance, degradation, hunger, sickness, and futility in which many other Americans live. They won't become involved in economic or political change until something brings the seriousness 
of the situation home to them. We need to see those protesting injustice, see the reasons behind their protest. We need to see the homeless person or the person struggling with addiction or with mental illness. Jesus saw each face in the crowd and had compassion. I'll be honest with you, it can be a dangerous thing to open your eyes and then allow your heart to feel and then to pray to God, the God of all compassion. God might just call you. God might just send you to do something. A man once stood before God, his heart breaking from the pain and injustice in the world. Dear God, he cried out, look at all the suffering, the anguish and the distress in our world. Why don't you send help? God responded, I will send help. I'm sending you. Last week, I quoted the poet Emily Dickinson. Here it is again. She writes, if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life, the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. Take her words in. This is such good news for all of us. For our lives to matter, we need only to touch and soothe one heart, one life, one pain. Then I shall not live in vain. I shall not live in vain. May God grant us eyes to see as Jesus saw and then respond with his big heart, especially, especially during this difficult time of pandemic and social protest. Let God's people say, Amen to that. Amen. I invite you now to please join me in prayer. We'll be using the prayer from this week's Presbyterian Outlook with a little addition. Lord God, as we navigate strong headwinds and seek to see you through our fatigue and fears, we confess that you are truly the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the one who stills the storm and immediately reaches out your hand to keep us from drowning. We rest for a moment in the joy of your presence, no longer afraid, free from anxiety, assured that you do not leave us alone, but seek us out when we are most in need of your peace. We know, Lord, of all that none of your thoughts, your hopes, our doubts or worries are off limits to your care and compassion. We know you, our teacher and our friend. We know that you welcome us as we are and hear whatever is on our hearts and our minds. We ask you to hear our prayers for those in, the midst, in our midst most battered by the storms of our time, both literal storms and, of course, the storm of this pandemic. Com com comfort those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Grab the hands of those about to go under the waves of poverty or financial crisis. We ask for your intervention on behalf of families unable to provide basic necessities for their children, our siblings wrestling with food insecurity, those on the cusp of eviction and the unemployed facing the end of benefits. As we see those about us about to be swamped by the waves of this pandemic, move us to act in ways that lift others out of the rolling sea. Reach out and give courage and strength and compassion to people in leadership positions. Grant them wisdom to make decisions in the best interests of the most vulnerable. Inspire communities to use their power and resources, their will and gifts to support the people on the margins, those for whom this difficult season has been catastrophic. 
We pray for teachers, administrators, parents, and students as they all seek to navigate a new school year rife with uncertainty and unprecedented challenges. We are mindful of essential workers who are facing the danger of this public health crisis every day. Protect and sustain them, Lord. We lift up the sick and all those who suffer. Give them hope, bring relief, surround them with your mercy. Quiet the dangerous winds of discord and division and stir up the breath of the Holy Spirit to heal and unite us. Help us to build up the body, strengthen our witness and reveal to the world that we follow the one who commands us to love one another. May others look at your church and see your hands and feet at work in the world, feeding and tending, forgiving and repairing, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with you, our God. In this moment, Lord God, we rest in your presence, certain that you are our Savior and the Savior of the world, able to do more abundantly than we can ever hope or imagine, never far from us, always reaching out your hand to save us when the fear of the winds and waves of life will overtake us. We worship and praise you as we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, even as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Trimmed in bed.